Some plants, however, do not give their pollinators any reward of any kind. In the warmer parts of Europe lives a whole group that bamboozle their pollinators into thinking that they're going to get a really sensational reward, a sexual one. Their little orchids and their flowers reproduce remarkably closely the signals that enable a male bee or wasp to recognize a female of the same species. Several have blue patches. One is fringed with what looks like fur. A wasp's wings in the right light do flash iridescent blue, and its abdomen is covered with thick brown fur. A female wasp also pumps out an identifying perfume, but the orchid does the same, and the result is irresistible. As the male wasp nuzzles forward in his attempts to mate, he butts the pollinia which stick to him like yellow horns. He seems to be well aware that something has happened to him but there's nothing he can do about it, and he flies off to try his luck elsewhere. Which, of course, is what the orchid requires, because this time he deposits the pollen on another bogus female. The hairs on many of these orchids run downwards, as though the female is sitting with her head up. But some reproduce her clinging head down, then the male must land that way if he wants to mate, and he will get the pollen stuck to his rear. This one too seems fully aware that he's got rather more than he bargained for. The orchid's mimicry is so convincing and enticing that sometimes a flower will attract a whole scrum of sex-crazed suitors. Some are trying to get to the orchid and will inadvertently deliver the pollen. Other males, since there seems to be a full house, attempt to mate with one another. Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and we're now back in chapter 37, the last chapter or in the case of this class being taught during a course uh, called the fall semester, this is not the last chapter. So I'll pick up with the mature seed that contains an embryonic plant and storage materials. You'll find this on page 791. A mature seed contains an embryonic plant and food stored in those seed leaves, the cotyledons or the endosperm. It also contains, that's surrounded, tough, protective seed coat, which is derived from integuments, which are the outermost layers of the ovule. So I'll say again, it contains an embryonic plant and food. It is surrounded by that tough protective seed coat, which is derived from, from integuments. And those are the tough outermost layers of the ovule, being the seed itself. So if you look closely, that is what you're seeing. I'll now continue. So the seed in turn is enclosed within a fruit. So keep in mind, this chapter is about nothing more than the way in which angiosperms reproduced. Because this chapter, Reproduce, is named Reproduction of Following Plants. So the mature embryo within the seed contains a short embryonic root known as the radical. That short embryonic root known as the radical. It also contains and embryonic shoot. So there again, I said that short embryonic root known as the radical. It also contains that embryonic shoot. Yes, I'm going slowly so you all can keep up. And then finally, it has one or two seed leaves known as cotyledons. 
So to help you out with what I'm getting to here, the seed itself, called a monocot seed, contains only one seed leaf. Hence they're referred to as being monocots. The eudicots or dicots have two seed leaves, two cotyledons. So the short portion of the embryonic shoot connecting the radical to one or more one or two cotyledons is known as the hypocotyl. So if you closely look at the figure being shown, figure 37.9, I show now the hypocotyl. And I'll say again, this is that short portion of the embryonic shoot that connects the radical to those seed leaves. And to help you out with what I just referred to, you can find that radical being that portion right there. That is the radical. The shoot apex, or terminal bud, located above the point of attachment of the seed leaves, or cotyledons, is known as the plumule. So if you look even closer, you'll find the plumule located there. So after the radical, the hypocotyl, and the cotyledon, or cotyledons, and plumule have formed, the young plant's development is arrested, meaning it stops. And of course, usually it's by desiccation or dormancy. So that dormancy I speak to is that temporary state of arrested physiological activity. So please keep this in mind because many times seeds are born dormant. And we'll get more to this later on. So when conditions are right for continuing the development program, the seed germinates and the embryo resumes growth. Many seeds are known to remain dormant for a decade or so. So that means as you walk around outside right now, many of those small plants that are now germinating may very well have been sitting there in the seed bank for a number of years. And now that the conditions are right, those seeds have now germinated. I'll now continue. So with that, only a few instances of germination after hundreds of years of dormancy have been scientifically documented. In 2008, a team of biologists in, from Israel and Switzerland successfully germinated a date seed. Yes, dates are pretty amazing to taste. That was radiocarbon dated to be about 2,000 years old. Now, if that date ain't old, please help me with what date is old. Over 2,000 years old. Oh my goodness. So before this report, the oldest known documented instance of germination was a 1,200-year-old lotus seed. Because the ammonic plant is non-photosynthetic, it must be nourished during germination until it becomes photosynthetic and therefore self-sufficient. Having said that, it's the seed leaves, the cotyledons of many plants, that function as storage organs and become large, thick, and fleshy as they absorb the food reserves, the starches, oils, and proteins. And this initially is produced as endosperm. Seeds that store nutrients in seed leaves have little or no endosperm at maturity. Examples of such seeds are peas, beans, squashes, sunflowers, and peanuts. Other plants, such as wheat and corn, have thin seed leaves, thin cotyledons, that function primarily to help the young plant digest and absorb food stored in the endosperm. So with this being stated, let's get on down to fruits, the mature ripened ovary. After double fertilization has taken place within the ovule, the ovule develops into a seed, and the ovary surrounding it develops into a fruit. The example before you is a pea pod. The pea pod is a fruit, and the peas within it are the seeds. How amazing is that? I, I would imagine that you were once told to eat your vegetables, when in fact you were told to eat your seeds from the fruit. Or maybe you were just told to eat your fruit, called, of course, the green bean. A fruit may contain one or more seeds, and some orchid fruits contain several thousands to a few million seeds. If that's not an amazing number of seeds, tell me what is. To contain a few million seeds per fruit? So fruits provide protection for the enclosed seeds, and sometimes they aid in their dispersal. 
There are several types of fruits, and their differences result from the variations in structure or arrangement of the flowers from which they were formed. There are four basic types of fruits. They are as follows, simple fruits, aggregate fruits, multiple fruits, and accessory fruits. Please see figure 3710. On page 793, figure 3710, is where I'll be here in just a moment. So most fruits are simple fruits. The simple fruit develops from a single ovary, which may consist of a single carpel or several fused carpels. At maturity, the simple fruit may be fleshy or dry. Two examples of simple fruit, or at least simple fleshy fruits, are berries and drupes. To help you with that, let us continue. So a berry, it's a fleshy fruit that has soft tissues throughout and contains few to many seeds. A blueberry is a berry. Grapes are also a berry, including cranberries. Even tomatoes, yes, they are a berry. Bananas are too a berry. So many so-called berries do not fit the botanical definition. Strawberries, raspberries, and mulberries, for example, are not berries at all. These three fruits will come up in just a moment. I'll now continue to what is known as the droop is a simple fleshy or fibrous fruit that contains a hard stone or pit surrounding a single seed. Examples of droops are almonds, peaches, olives, and plums. The almond shell is actually the stone, which remains after the rest of the fruit has been removed. How amazing is this? It makes me want to get more fruit. So now I'll get to those nextly. Many simple fruits are dry at maturity, and some of them split open along seams called sutures to release their seeds. A milkweed pod is an example of a follicle, a simple dry fruit that develops from a single carpel and splits open along one suture to release its seeds. This would be an example from the milkweed, the follicle. Now that I'm in the center, this example would be from where we are now with the legume, as I now continue. Pea pods. A legume is a simple, dry fruit that develops from a single carpel and splits along two sutures. As you look closely, here in the center, this, an this is an example of a legume. Pea pods are legumes, as are green beans, although both are generally harvested before the fruit is dried out and split open. I cannot imagine having green beans that are dry and already splitting open. The same for those pea pods. Pea seeds are usually removed from the fruit and consumed, whereas the green beans are eaten entirely, and the seeds, of course. So the entire fruit eaten. A capsule is a simple dry fruit that develops from two or more fused carpels and splits along two or more sutures or pores. Examples are including the poppy, the iris, and cotton. So as you look to the immediate right here, this would be an example of a capsule. And yes, I say again, cotton is a fruit. Most of which that you're seeing there is nothing more than cellulose. How soft it is. Other simple dry fruits, such as the caryopsis, or grains, do not split open at maturity. So to help you with that, fruits that open at maturity are known as being dehiscent fruit. They are dehiscent. Fruit that do not open at maturity are known as being in dehiscent. So the caryopsis or grain, they do not split open at maturity. Each caryopsis contains a single seed. Because the seed coat is fused to the fruit wall, a caryopsis looks like a seed rather than a fruit. Kernels of corn and wheat are both grains or the caryopsis. How amazing it is. And that's why it's stated to be whole grain. 
It includes everything. Nextly, it is the Akeem. The Akeem is similar to a Caryopsis in that it is simple and dry and does not split open at maturity, being indehiscent. And it also contains one seed. However, the seed coat of an Akeem is not fused with the fruit wall. Instead, the single seed is attached to the fruit wall at one point, permitting an Akeem to be separated from its seed. A perfect example of the Akeem is the sunflower root. You will likely mention, oh, I love sunflower seeds. So you put the Akeem in your mouth and maybe a little crack crack here, crack crack there. And of course you then have the seed itself. So one can pull or at least peel off the fruit wall being that shell to reveal the sunflower seed within. Nextly, nuts. Nuts are simple dry fruits that have a stony wall and do not spin open at maturity, again being indehiscent. Unlike a king's, nuts are usually large, single-seeded, and often derived from a compound ovary. Examples of nuts are things such as the acorn, the chestnut, and hazelnuts. Many so-called nuts do not fit the botanical definition, such as peanuts and Brazil nuts. They are seeds, not nuts at all. So what you're seeing there at the bottom from left to right is the caryopsis. The akeem and a nut. Next up are aggregate fruits. So aggregate fruits are the second main type of fruit. An aggregate fruit is formed from a single flower that contains several to many separate carpels. After fertilization, each ovary from each individual carpel enlarges. As each of those individual carpels enlarges, ovaries may fuse to form a single fruit. Examples include magnolia fruits, raspberries, and blackberries. Those are all aggregate fruits. So with that being stated, there they are. If you look closely, you likely have indulged in some of this at least once in your lives. I know that they taste quite amazing. And what amazes me even, I guess I'll say even more so, is the price they put on these things when you find them in the stores near you. If you happen to find these in the stores near you. So looking at this, you do see the flower here. And this is figure 37 and 11. So it's been cut away to give the view, the view of this blackberry flower. The blackberry flower called Lubus trivialis. So it's showing those mini carpels. Those separate carpels in the center of the flower here in figure 3711a. So looking there, all of those carpels in the center there will eventually make that one fruit. So in figure 3711b, you're seeing the developing blackberry because each of those are those tiny little droops and then the little quote-unquote hairs on the blackberry are rudiments of stigmas and styles. So as you look at this portion here, yes, you're seeing the stigma and the style, the stigma and the style, the stigma and the style, and even remnants of the stamens there on the sepals that remain. So there you go, looking here, it's how amazing is this to see everything you've learned, at least in this section of the text, in the 37th chapter, and you've been doing this uh, likely your entire lives. Above next are multiple fruits. It's the third type. It's formed from the ovaries of many flowers that grow in proximity on a common floral stalk. So the ovary from each flower fruit fuses with nearby ovaries as it develops and enlarges. After fertilization, figs and mulberries are multiple fruits, as well as the pineapple being an example of a multiple fruit. So it's pretty amazing that you may have seen the pineapple, maybe not many days ago, and see all those little circular indentations along the outside. Well, that's where all those flowers were, which of course have now allowed those ovaries to fuse. And then of course, develop into what you call now a pineapple. Up next is the accessory fruit. 
Accessory fruits, the fourth type, differ from other fruits in that plant tissues, in addition to ovary tissue, make up the fruit. The example here is that the edible portion of a strawberry is red, and of course, that fleshy receptacle. I'll say again, the edible portion of a strawberry is the red, fleshy receptacle. Think back to the diagram you've labeled, showing you, of course, the basic structure of the flower. Well, yes, indeed, the red portion of the receptacle. In the meantime, apples and pears are also ac accessory fruits. So the outer part of each of these fruit is an enlarged floral tube consisting of the receptacle tissue along with portions of the calyx that surrounds the ovary. And the apple may also be referred to as being a palm, a specific type of fruit called the palm. So there you are. And if you closely look at why this apple appears in such a way, if you were to invert this apple, you would be seeing where those sepals once were. And then of course, that's how it is. So as the apple continues throughout its development, it will begin to invert itself. And then of course, become picked. So now let's get to how seed dispersal is highly varied and quite variable. So the states, wind, animals, water, and explosive dehiscence disperses the various seeds and fruits of flowering plants. Effective methods of seed dispersal have made it possible for certain plants to expand their geographic range. In some cases, the seed is actually the agent of dispersal, and in others, the fruit performs this role. In tumbleweeds, such as the, Rus the Russian thistle, the entire plant is the agent of dispersal because it detaches and blows across the ground, scattering its seeds every bunch along. Tumbleweeds are lightweight and sometimes blown many kilometers by the wind. And I'm sure you all have likely heard the part of the tumbleweed or have seen the tumbleweed, one of those old western movies that my dad would love to watch and I would not want to watch it. So to help you out with the way in which the wind disperses seeds, if you look closely here, this is figure 3713a, the feathery plumes of milkweed from the genus Asclepius has seeds, and of course, those plumes make those seeds buoyant for dispersal by wind. I planted, I think I began with three milkweed plants in the yard, and they were in a flower bed, but I now find milkweed plants all over, and this is that very reason why. They are wind dispersed. And that's just one example. Another example would be those winged fruits of maple tree. Along that same note, another example would be the dandelion. You likely have been outside one spring and picked up one of those stalks with the white things at the top of the little ball. And you gave it a little blow blow, and of course, as you blew, all the places they went. So, as I mentioned it, it's just wind is responsible for seed dispersal in many plants. Plants such as I just mentioned being the maple trees have winged fruits adapted for wind dispersal. The same is the case for those light, feathery plumes that enable other seeds or fruits to be transported by wind, such as the dandelion and milkweeds, and they go considerable distances. So that is an amazing adaptation for these to, of course, not only get from point A to point B, but get, of course, a long way away from where they once were to continue the life cycle. Some plants have special structures that aid in dispersal of seeds, and fruits by animals. The spines and barbs of burdock burrs and similar fruits they catch in, in animal fur and fall off as the animal moves about. So as you look closely here, check out what is called figure 3713b. And there it is. That's the burdock from Arctium, the genus. So those burdock burrs have those hooked fruits and they're carried away from the parent plant. By sticking, to the, by sticking to bird feathers, 
human clothing or mammal fur. And I must admit, as a young child walking around during those dog days of summer, as it's once called, I don't know why I called it all dog days, but I can remember many times getting back to the house and seeing these things sticking to my jeans or sticking to my socks. Like, why are you here? What are you doing here? But of course, it's nothing more than the dispersal of those burdock burrs or other fruit that are sticky for dispersal. I'll continue. Fleshy edible fruits are also adapted for animal dispersal. Birds, bats, primates, grazing ruminants, and ants are common dispersal agents. So these, ag these animals are attracted to the fruit by its color, taste, odor, or even just by it being in the right location. As the animal eats these fruits, it either discards or swallows the seeds. Many seeds that are swallowed have thick seed coats and are not digested. Instead, they pass through the digestive tract and are deposited in the animal's feces some distance from that parent plant. In fact, class, paying close attention, I hope that you are. Some seeds will not germinate unless they have passed through an animal's digestive tract. So the animal's digestive juices probably aid in germination by helping break down that tough seed coat, which is derived from the decades. So some edible fruits apparently contain chemicals that function as laxatives to speed seeds through the animal's digestive tract. The less time the seeds spend in the gut, the more likely they are to germinate. So to help you with what, I've, what was mentioned then, if you look closely, figure 3713D as in dog, what you shall now see are the fleshy fruits, such as the blackbirds I mentioned just moments ago, eaten by animals such as the white-footed mouse. The seeds are frequently swallowed whole and passed through unharmed by way of the digestive tract of the animal. So I hope that you do rinse off those berries you may indeed pick. I'll now continue. Excuse me. So here, I'll get to animals such as squirrels and many bird species also help to disperse acorns and other fruits and seeds by burying them for winter use. Many buried seeds are never used by the animals and germinate the following spring. Ants collect the seeds of many plants and take them underground to their nests. Ants disperse and bury seeds for hundreds of plant species in almost every terrestrial environment, from the northern coniferous forests to tropical rainforests and deserts. So both ants and flowering plants benefit from their association. The ants ensure the reproductive success of the plants whose seeds may vary, and the plants supply food to the ants. Sounds a bit of like uh, the work in yellow here, the you are A bit of mutualistic electric here. So I can state as such, a seed is a seed that is collected and taken on the ground by ants, often contains a special structure called an eliasome or oil body that protrudes from the seed. The elasomes are nutritious food for the ants, which carry seeds underground before removing the elasome. Once the elasome is removed from the seed, the ants discard the undamaged seed in an underground refuse pile, which happens to be rich in organic material, such as ant droppings and, of course, dead ants, and minerals, which, of course, are the inorganic nutrients required by young seedlings. Thus, ants not only bury the seeds away, from animals that might eat them, but they also place seeds in a rich soil that is ideal for germination and seedling growth. So as you look, so as you look closely, here with figure 3713C, you're seeing the dispersal of seeds by ants. So the brown part of each blood root is the seed Proper. and the white part is the liaison or oil body. The seeds have been placed along the mid vein of an oak leaf to indicate the scale to show you their relative size. 
here we are now with explosive dehiscence. Well, excuse me, before we get to explosive dehiscence, I'll go to the water. The coconut is an example of a fruit adapted for dispersal by water. The coconut has air spaces that make it buoyant and capable of being carried by ocean currents for thousands of kilometers. When it washes ashore, the seed may germinate and grow into a coconut palm tree. This takes me back to when I taught you all the principles of biology one course, and I mentioned, of course, special cases of drift by getting, of course, to what is known as the founder effect. I mentioned in the course of coconut washing up on the beach. Well, at that beach, maybe they're the beach of some island, of course, and maybe at that new island by way of that beach, and they are no coconut trees for those that are in. However, if you come back maybe 15 to 30 years later and the island is now covered in coconut trees, this is how. So the story wasn't just made up. Some seeds are not dispersed by wind, animals, or even water. Such seeds are found in the fruits that use explosive dehiscence, in which the fruit bursts open suddenly and quite often violently forcibly discharging its seeds. These fruits burst open due to the pressure caused by differences in turgor pressure or hydrostatic pressure as those cells in the fruit dry out. The fruits of plants such as the touch me not and bittercress can split open explosively. So explosively, excuse me. The fruits of plants such as the tushmanot and bittercress spoken so explosively that seeds are scattered a meter or more. So this figure here shown showed you a bit of what explosive dehiscence may look like from figure 3713E. So there you have it. This is explosive dehiscence with cardamine hirsuta, the bittercress. So we're now here with germination and early growth. Flowering plants, pollination, fertilization, are followed by seed and fruit development. Each seed develops from an ovule and contains an embryonic plant and food to provide nourishment for the embryo during germination. What I've just given you there, I hope you noticed. That's part of your homework, to be, to be able to explain not just what is that process of double fertilization, but also to be able to explain its importance to angiosperms. So germination is the process of a seed sprouting and the growth of the young seedling into of the mature plant are aspects of growth and development. Within a given species, there is a precise set of requirements for seed germination that represent those evolutionary adaptations that protect the young seedlings from adverse environmental conditions. Environmental cues such as the presence of water and oxygen, proper temperature, and sometimes the presence of light penetrating the soil surface influence whether or not a seed germinates. No seed germinates unless it has absorbed water. So with that, we're going to down to what is called imbibition. The embryo in a mature seed is dehydrated, and a watery environment is necessary for active metabolism. When a seed germinates, its metabolic machinery is then turned on, and numerous, I repeat, and numerous materials are synthesized, and others are degraded. Therefore, water is that absolute requirement for germination to ensue. I think about this all the time as I plant plants in the garden. It's, it's one of the most amazing things to A, plant that seed, but that seed will do nothing unless, of course, it has adequate water. So, with that being stated, the absorption of water by a dry seed is induction. Here in figure 3714, we have pinto bean seeds. You gotta have pinto beans, you all. And on the left, that's before induction. And on the right, that's it thereafter, 
of course, upon imbibing water. So dry seeds imbibe water before they germinate. As a seed imbibes water, it often swells to several times its, its original size. And I'm referring to its original dry size there. So cells imbibe water by the adhesion of water onto and into materials such as pectin and starches along with cellulose within the seed. So having said it this way, it's that germination and subsequent growth require a great deal of energy because young plants obtain this energy by converting the energy of food molecules stored in the seeds endosperm or seed leaves called cotyledons to ATP during, during aerobic respiration. Much oxygen is needed during germination. Some plants, such as rice, grow in flooded soil where oxygen is absent and carry out alcohol fermentation during the early stages of germination and see them grow. How amazing it is that rice can go through alcohol fermentation. It must, it must be nice to just sit there in the, the I guess I'll say the water, and make alcohol until, of course, you can photosynthesize. So they can A, make alcohol, and B, go to the process of photosynthesis. Rice has it made. And I'm saying that because they can, of course, synthesize the energy they need by way of that alcohol fermentation pathway, using, of course, 2 ATP, and not nearly 36 or 38 ATP by way of aerobic respiration as well. That's what I mean. So temperature is another environmental factor that affects germination. Each species has an optimal or ideal temperature at which the germination percentage is highest. Most plants have an optimum germination temperature between 77 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. This is why having a raised bed in the garden out back, you all, I can germinate seeds very early in, this, in the year. And the same way, some seeds can be germinated at temperatures lower than that, but of course that gets to the specificity of those requirements for seed germination. In other words, some seeds, such as those with apples, require a prolonged exposure to low temperatures before their seeds will break dormancy and germinate. So some of the environmental factors needed for germination to help ensure the survival of the young plant. The requirement of a prolonged low temperature period ensures that seeds adapted to temperature, temperate climates generate in the spring rather than fall. And some seeds, especially those with tiny seeds, such as lettuce, require light for germination. A light requirement ensures the tiny seeds germinate only if it's close to the soil surface. If such a seed were to germinate several centimeters below the soil surface, it might not have enough food reserves to grow to the surface. And then, of course, if the light dependent seed remains dormant until the soil is disturbed and is brought to the surface, however, it has a much greater likelihood of survival. So, with that, I shall now continue. I mentioned this moments ago, back when we were learning about seeds, and of course, them having to go through the gut. But now I'll get to some seeds do not generate immediately. Getting back to dormancy. Mature seed is often dormant and may not germinate immediately, even if the growing conditions are ideal. In certain seeds, the internal factors, which are under genetic control prevent germination, and even when all external conditions are favorable. Many seeds are not dormant because certain chemicals are present or absent or because the seed coat restricts germination. For example, seeds of many desert plants contain high concentrations of, abs of abscisic acid, which inhibits germination under unfavorable conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. It's only until rainfall washes off that, abs that abscisic acid and sufficient rainfall then that could support the plants' growth after the seed germinates. Some seeds, such as certain legumes, have a hard, thick seed coat that prevents water and oxygen from entering, thereby inducing dormancy. Here, scarification, the process of scratching or scarring the seed coat physically with a knife or chemical with acid, before sowing it induces germination in these plants. 
Scarification in nature occurs, for example, when the seeds pass through the digestive tract of animals, or when the seed coats are partially digested by soil bacteria. So let's get to <clears throat> excuse me, early growth, characteristics of dicots and monocots. So here we are. Once conditions are right for germination, the first part of the plant to emerge from the seed is the radical or embryonic root. As the root grows and forces its way through the soil, it encounters considerable friction from soil particles. A root cap protects the, the delicate apical meristem of the root tip. The shoot, meaning, is, is next to emerge from the seed. Stem tips are not protected by a structure comparable to a root cap. The plants have ways to protect the delicate tip as it grows through the soil to the surface. The stem of a bean seedling, which is the dicot you all, for instance, curves over to form that hook so that the stem tip and the cotyledons are actually pulled up through the soil. Please see figure 3515a, the common bean, the dicot. So the hook in the stem protects that delicate stem tip as it grows through the soil. That tip is protected, you all. So once the shoot emerges in the soil, the hook then straightens. And then, of course, you have those two leaves. Corn, on the other hand, and grasses, which are monocots, have a special sheath of cells called the coleoptile. And the coleoptile is what surrounds and protects the young shoot. So first, the coleoptile pushes up to the soil, then the leaves and stem go through the tip of the coleoptile. And do bear in mind, as I said in, in a prior chapter, that there are no petioles in monocots. They have that sheath. And I just mentioned, of course, that coleoptile being that sheath of cells that protect. So with corn and figure 3715a, that monocot, the coleoptile, that sheath of cells, emerges first in the soil, and then the shoot and leaves go through the middle of the coleoptile class. So we'll now get to what is called asexual reproduction in flowering plants. The flowering plants have many kinds of asexual reproduction, of which involve modified stems. They are as follows, rhizomes, tubers, bulbs, corms, and stolons. Let us begin. The rhizome is nothing more than a horizontal underground stem that may or may not be fleshy. Fleshiness indicates that the rhizome is used for storing food materials such as starch. Although rhizomes resemble roots, they are actually, I say again, a horizontal underground stem. As indicated by the presence of the scale-like leaves, buds, nodes, and internodes. Roots have none of which. Rhizomes frequently branch in different directions and over time the old portion of the rhizome dies and two branches eventually separate to become distinct plants. Examples are bamboo, ginger, irises, and many grasses. This is why if you happen to pull up that dog on grass, y'all, it will come right back because you only pulled up that the portion that's above ground. Some rhizomes produce greatly thickened ends called tubers. So tubers are a fleshy underground stem that is enlarged for food storage. When the attachment between the tuber and its parent's plant breaks, often as a result of the death of the parent plant, the tuber grows into a separate plant. I say again, the tuber will grow into a separate plant. Potatoes are one example. Another that I'll mention are called elephant's ear, cladium. This is why you will n never in your life see me plant elephant ears on any property that I own. So the eyes of the potato are the axillary buds. I think you know what I mean if you looked at those potatoes before. And this is evidence that the tuber is an underground stem rather than a storage root, such as a sweet potato or a carrot. Now you will see the difference I do hope. 
Next up is the bulb. So a bulb is a modified underground bud in which fleshy storage leaves are attached to a short stem. As you all follow along with me, a bulb is globose, meaning round and covered by paper-like bulb scales, which are modified leaves. It frequently forms axillary buds that develop into small daughter bulbs or bulblets, and these new bulbs are initially attached to the parent plant bulb, but when the parent plant bulb dies and rots away, each daughter bulb can become established as a separate plant. Examples are as follows, onions, daffodils, tulips, and lilies. Up next will be the corm. A corm is a short, erect underground stem that superficially resembles a bulb. Unlike the bulb, whose food is stored in underground leaves, the corm storage organ is a thickened underground stem covered by papery scales or modified leaves. Axillary buds frequently give rise to new corms, and the death of the parent corm separates these daughter corms, which then become established as separate plants. The crocus, gladiolus, and the succulent are examples of corms, and you find these in the garden. Up next are stolons. The stolon, or runner, is a horizontal above-ground stem that grows along the surface and have long internodes. Buds developing along the stolon, and each bud gives rise to a new shoot, so that roots of the ground. So each bud gives rise to a new shoot that roots into the ground. So when the stolon dies, the daughter plants live separately. The strawberry plant produces stolons. And even as I mention this, I have not once seen my strawberry plants produce these things called stolons and grow and grow and grow and grow. I, I, I know my son would enjoy seeing such because he loves to go back there and get in the garden and look for strawberries. Next up are plantlets. Next up are plantlets. So as I mention these things called plantlets, is that some plants form those detachable plantlets or small plants in notches along the leaf margins. So with that, the Canonico, the Canonico, whose common name is Mother of Thousands, has merosomatic tissue giving rise to any, an individual plantlet at each notch in the leaf. When these plantlets reach a certain size, they drop to the ground, root, and grow. Class, I hope you see the picture I'm painting. If you can't, stay with me. Next up are suckers. Some plants reproduce asexually by producing suckers, above ground shoots that develop from adventitious buds on roots. Each sucker grows additional roots and becomes an independent plant when the parent plant dies. Examples include the black locust, the pear, the apple, the cherry tree, the blackberry, and the aspen, the quaking aspen class, poplar shumiloids. There's a colony of these found in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah. Class, this thing consists of 47,000 tree trunks, formed all class from suckers that can be traced back to one single individual. This organism class is, is so massive that it includes and occupies over 100 acres. It says 106 acres. And at one point, because the, the quaking aspen is beautiful, I wanted to plant one in my backyard. And you can buy a lot of things glass online these days. I'm glad that I did not, because it might have been that my tree would be so huge that it would take up an estimated 10, 20, 30, or even up to 100 acres of land. It has beautiful white bark with those black lines and splotches, and amazing yellow foliage in fall. Please look it up. The Quaking Aspen. So some weeds, such as field bindweed, produce many suckers, and these plants are, as it states, difficult to control because pulling the plant out of the soil seldom removes all of the roots. 
which can grow as deep as 10 feet. In fact, in response to wounding, the roots produced additional suckers, which can be a considerable nuisance to humans. Let me put it this way, class. These examples I just gave you all, from rhizomes to tubers to bulbs to corns to stolons, all the way over to plantlets and suckers. I say this is why I say you all should educate yourselves on what it is you plant in your yards or in your field, or just what you buy at that neighborhood store. Because it may be pretty class the first year, or even that second year. But thereafter class is going to spread. And this is all class done asexually. So with that, the last thing I'll do here class, we'll go through apomixis. An apomixis class is the production of seeds and fruit without sexual reproduction. I'll be brief here. For example, the embryo may develop from a diploid cell in the ovule rather than from a diploid zygote that forms from the union of two haploid gametes. Because there are no fusion of gametes, the embryo is virtually genetically identical to the maternal genotype. However, the advantage of apomixis over other methods of asexual reproduction is that the seeds and fruit produced by apomixis can be dispersed by those means associated with sexual reproduction. So apomixis occurs in various species of more than 40 angiosperm families and is often found in plants which are polyploids, with of course some degree of sterility because they have multiple sets of chromosomes class. And the last of which will be that just keep in mind how sexual reproduction in plants occurs in comparison to what I ended the lecture with being asexual reproduction in plants. This has been the 37th chapter. Please prepare well for your final exam and ensure that you have your homework ready to turn in. If I can ever help you class, let me know and I plan to of course post a review or maybe even a series of reviews. Thank you all for listening class. This has been your instructor, Scholar Huff.